Hi all, Randy Green here, video two. I have given it some thought. And as always with process products, as you know, I am the speaker of and the advocate for, um, which means that we are, we're beginning with an idea and ideas have a specific way of develop as they unfold their content. And we kind of think with the idea that it is to become something and then we begin working with it and then it unfolds its potentials and shows us, oh, wow, there are more depths to it. There are more layers to it. There are more we could do with it. How can we then play with it? And as an inventor, it is important not to lose sight of, okay, where do I want to go with this and what is the idea? And with uh, this change maker material, I kind of just stumbled upon, I started with as in, yes, let's just talk about the issues and some of the, the challenges as in kind of in a news, uh, this is what we need to do kind of way. And then as I began working with it, I could see, well, quite a lot of you think you're change makers and you want to become change makers and you want to change the world and you want to change everything and you want to change things into a better place or a better future, which I talked about and which is my main goal of whatever that means and it can play on many different levels um when we talk about a better future we're talking inside this solar system or outside this solar system and to be honest the, the grand purpose of everything i'm doing i am doing is the attempt to try and get as many as possible to do the transition and get back into the possibility and the ability to do the elevation cycles. So that's a very grand purpose, right? So when we are, I'm here talking two branches here, we're talking about being an inventor, not losing sight and how our product will, will process and develop over time. And by that, give us new insights and change. And eventually we'll come to a completion where we could see the product was not just the goal of creating something specific. The product itself was the process. So that's also important to understand when we're talking about knowledge and what will be and what is in the highest prize Era, uh, area of when we talk about the future of humanity as well as the alien races that are here, they are trading knowledge, consciousness, energy units. They are not trading technology. For them, technology is the simplest thing in the world. And I agree, and I want to talk about that in a little while as well when we talk about uh, implementing the project or the product or whatever we have come up with. So for us, the most important thing is the creational process where we make the architecture, where we think about what we're going to do. And then we follow with the flow of the product as it begins to unravel its information systems. And I talk about the complexity information systems in the whole transition science course one to four, uh, about the psychic energy, psychic processes, keeping the psychic energetic balance, which then goes into the beginning of the uh, advanced work with the emotional field, because that goes with our self perception and the understanding or how we process information and how we learn to really use our brain capacity to understand what we are actually dealing with. So that's what I'm doing here for you as in kind of, I'm not trying to bog you down with all sorts of information and this is impossible kind of thing, but I'm trying to give you the advanced perspective of, okay, what is the goal of what we're doing? And I want, that's another one of the branches that I want to go into. So I'm always working on many branches within this pattern of information that at some point will come to a head, sum it all up, and then you will stand on the top of the mountain and say, oh yeah, that was the entire process and all the layers and all of the little um, hoops and loops we had to go through to get to the understanding of what it actually means to be a change maker and why it is so difficult to instigate changes, both uh, on an energetic level, but also in the reality. And that's where I want to pull in some of my experiences from Australia, where I actually try to go to a, go to a different country, which should be West, a Western country, right? And uh, people live, living there might be the, the descenders of Europe, but everything down there were what we call the factions that are there were dissimilar to the more modernized factions that actually exist here in Europe. So there was a lot of limitations coming as a quote unquote foreigner from a different environment, a different faction and coming to Australia, even though people were nice, we're not talking about humans here. We're talking about the aliens that are controlling the different jurisdictions, which is also part of when we are 
doing the progression work, and we at the same time try to be to become change makers, and you're working with the ways I work, you will have that label above you on the highest level that you are working with material that at some point should get you back into the elevation cycle. And if you're then living in a country or in a jurisdiction where the factions are have no interest in us doing the elevation cycles, well, you can figure out that's probably not the environment for you to be in because they will block stop you at every corner, every turn, everything that you want to embark on. They will shut it down one way or another, which was what I experienced in Australia. And I want to talk about this the battles between the factions, which is also something that we will come in alignment with when we talk about beginning to create business, because you can kind of hear being a change maker kind of leads to not only the change with ourselves, which is part of the progression work, but there, that's the preliminary understanding. The progression work covers all of the basis of the psychological changes and the understanding of what it means to progress as a human that are trying to do the elevation cycle and get back to the original configuration of our system. So that's step one. But at the same time, we are also having the psychology change within the base program and other people that are not doing the progression work. And we're having the psychology of resistance, both from people, but also from the factions that are controlling our planet, including the resistance that you might have in yourself, which you are not aware of, because some of it is psychological, some of it it depends on past lives and what you've encountered there. And some of it goes up to the factions that are technically controlling your template. Because even though I would love to tell all of you, you are free people, you can do whatever you want to do. That's not the case. And it's not been the case. Go back in any religion whatsoever. It doesn't matter which one you look into. People have been the workers, quote, slaves, quote, breeders, quote, whatever, of the gods for 15,000 years, if not more. And the people, whoever civilizations have been part of, work to appease the gods, to, to give them different forms of sacrifices, food, animals, what have you. If they wanted to do something, they were praying to the gods. If they wanted children, they prayed to the gods. If they wanted anything, they prayed to the gods to be allowed to get it. So this is, this is a fact about a reality. And you, we live in the Western world and some of you are still religious, some of you are not, some of you are spiritual, some of you are not. doesn't really matter. The basic concept of the human civilization is that we are not free people. And when we talk about Christianity and, and Paul, St. Paul, he was literally saying that we are all slaves in the society because he literally lived in a society where people were slaves. They were not uh, getting paid as we are today, but they were slaves under the different landlords and they were, uh, as long as they were slaves within the Greek society, they had this uh, 50 years of enslavement and they would become a free person. There were rules regarding this, including within uh, the Jewish population that were allowed to have slaves for so long and then they had to set them free and ensure that they had something to live from and that's they they rarely got uh, land but they would get a piece of the land which they would then um, administer for the landlord but they will still have to pay the landlord to be able to have the land so there was no really freedom there it was all about yeah you need to survive you need a place to live you need something to eat either you work under me and I'll make sure the patron would make sure the people would get that or you get your own land, but then you have to pay tax. You have to pay this and that, whatever. How do you have to pay 20% of whatever you're growing to me? So you are allowed to have your house on my property. So this is again, this is what it is. We're still living under that one today. That's why we go to work and earn money so we can pay rent and pay for everything. We are not free people. And I know many of you out there saying, Oh, that's just a, a construction. That's just a perception of mind and. If I think that I'm free and I work as if I'm free and I go off grid and I flip the finger at society and say, fuck you all, I'm going off. I'm not looking at the news. I'm not on the internet. I'm not anything. I'm just doing my, my off grid community or I'm living by the land. I'm living by this. I'm living by that. You will understand that you are under different type of construction, constrictions that are when you work with the land, you will discover, yeah, you're free to grow your own crops. Well, then it's not raining. Then it's raining too much. Then there's too windy. Then there's no wind. Then the earth dry out. Then your crops won't uh, give any, uh, they don't wield enough so that you kind of get what you need 
to survive and you will then stand there and not, and you'll begin to come under the, the circumstances of hunger, which many people are around the world that have no job but are living off the land. And they discover how hard that work is that even though you work with the soil every day, if there's no rain, then there is nothing is growing and you can't support yourself. You're not free there either. So there is no place on this planet you're a free person. And I think that is an important feature to really grasp. You are not free, even though if you're all alone on an island and you've got everything that you need, you will not be free either because you will then discover all the things that you hold and what you are and what you are connected to and what is going on inside of you. So we are not free by existence. We are not free by support and sustainability. And we are not free by who and what we are energetically and consciously. So these are the things that we are up against. And that's where many have just kind of bent and said, yeah, that's it. And then they just push it away and say, I'm not going to be a change maker. So those of you who go far back with me, you know I'm also talking about, and the Buddhist talks about that. It's the path of liberation. It's the path of liberating you from everything that you are entangled into that are technically keeping you stuck within the base program, within the physical reality where you do not belong. And that is an important feature to have. You don't belong here. And then people have different ways of responding to this. They either go off in a frenzy or they, they get angry or they get sad or they get all the whole spectrum of emotions, which some people need to work their way through to get to the point where they understand that all of this emotionality about it is not going to free you. Whatever you feel about it is not going to change anything. It's just going to make things much more difficult for you. Not to suppress the emotions. I keep saying that we have. If you need to cry, do the crying. But do five to ten minutes. And don't go into complete self-pity and me, 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 and all these kind of things. Because what's the point of that other than you feeling miserable and you will feel out for days and you will have grown a plethora of new types of energetic parasites, which is the whole game of getting you to respond to your emotionality and create specific electrochemical energies that will then pull in specific fourth dimensional energetic parasites and link you up to specific programs where will then push you into that direction where you really think that you can't do a damn thing because you can. And when we talk about people that are traumatized and have this fear of doing whatever, that's because some of you have fought with these cubes earlier in previous lifetimes. And some of you have fought different programs where you have seen different features. For instance, I am pretty sure that although we do have underworld factions and, and features and we do have creatures that surface both organic and non-organic, the majority of what people are seeing, for instance, within Christianity are programs, complete programs. Um, the real beings look somewhat different, again, depending on who and what you are and what your purpose is. But, you know, as a releaser, I've seen quite a lot. So I've learned to deal with these things and they do create a lot of fear and they do create a lot of contamination of your energy system. And this is not to be taken lightly because the second cycle shells and what's left of the timeline event and who stood uh, remained after the second cycle, which were a very little percentage. The right rest was pushed into what we call a type of network on our planet that would then put under what we call some kind of containment. And that containment is breaking down because the uh, overall program of the old world order is breaking down. So everything is just kind of whatever was in the cages are now being let loose just to put it in another analogy so you understand it. And these cages were, of course, energetic. So whatever was put down there from, from those of us who were reseeded after the second cycle uh, into some kind of new form in the third cycle, and there also failed and were reseeded again in the fourth cycle after where we kind of made some pretty... Um, stuck, let me call that one, very heavy decisions about, okay, what do we do and how do we go further from that? Literally putting most of these original vessels in stasis and then recreating new type of vessel, which is the origin of the physical form we have today. Although the one that we are in are more based upon the Neanderthal projects of the humanoid, the Niburian races that created a new type of subspecies, which we know, um, <clears throat> which is the main blueprint for the majority of the humans, at least 
for the Y chromosome, um, there is connection there, but you know, females have tendencies to have spores of the Y chromosome, and one of our X chromosomes used to be a Y chromosome, so some females have the Neanderthal strain as well, but they have the Eve version of it because we had the first Adam and Eve, not uh, as the Bible says, but the first created engineered uh, human vessel. Nothing to do with the Hebrew Bible. I'm just calling the Adam the Eve because the military projects and all the projects later on have used this expression to just denote the first man and the first female within a specific type of groups of uh, creatures because they are created and engineered um, to be seeded onto this planet. But there are many different variations of this. The original one were nothing had to do with the type of human form we have today. So that's also a bit of a problem that our transformative energy system is technically engineered for a different type of vessel that functions within density one energy, whereas the physical form is engineered to function inside the in the the, um, the insulation. I was going to say that because that is what it is, the reality program that we are part of, we're insulated in this physical form so that we still have the transformative energy system, but it's dormant and what we're processing and using are the three lower fields, as you know. And that means that we are technically imprisoned in everything that we create ourselves. So that's the first part of liberation. The Buddhism goes into that as well, which is why I took the time to do my take on Buddhism, which you'll find on the Hall Academy YouTube channel. So when we talk about this freeing of the three lower fields, if you want to do the Buddhist way or you do the whole transition science classes where I talk about the same issues and go into the depth of these different layers, which is much more expanded than what we have got left of Buddhism, because whatever Buddhism is today and whatever concepts are within Buddhism, most of these are made later on by the Naga Yuna school, which come Naga Yuna is technically a guy, but it means someone who is instructed by the wisdom snakes. And Buddhism has a lot of uh, white Syrian snakes connected to them which we could say is of a higher class or a higher order, similar as when we talk about the Hindu underworld, there are at least different seven layers of different types of deities or um, both uh, what we call Dakinis as well as um, Devas, as well as are the, the plus side and the negative side, as well as the ones that are in form, the ones that are out of form, the uh, Rupa, the ones that are outside of form and the uh, the Rupas that are inside of form, the Petris, the Lunas, their ancestors and all these kind of things, which we kind of know they they classified it, of course, within a concept of uh, um, Dianism as a kind of a god world. Uh, but the matter of the fact is when we talk about Indra and we talk about some of our Yuna and our Yuna is an, a reptile or a Drago and all of these kind of things where we see, well, this is what they interpreted it to be. But the matter of the fact is these are different classifications of alien species, which is why they look as they do. The, the Hindu gods are clearly Aryan Shivas. And I met these and not as gods, but as aliens that are operating and have been operating on our planet. So whatever that is, we can say, well, looking into the ancient religions and looking into the ancient text and what has been made there and what's been going through hands over human hands for so long and been interpreted by humans, by that the collective fields of these interpretation systems have been made, which means that if we do do Buddhism and do it the way that it's taught in the, in the sciences of Buddhism, we will get entangled with the thought forms of Buddhism and then we'll just get stuck there because Technically, Buddhism only worked while Buddha was there. Once he was gone, Buddhism fell apart. And you can say the same with my teachings. As long as I'm here, they work because I can correct it. I can work with it. I can protect my thought form. I can go in and make sure it stands pristine and I can uh, process it and I can uh, develop it and progress it. So it will always be up to speed, which is what I'm doing. And I can erase the thought forms that no longer are useful for us. And that's why some of my older material is not out there anymore. That's why I deleted my blogs. That's why I delete things because I am keeping my thought form pristine, up to speed, up to date. Once I'm gone, nobody's doing that. And then these thought forms will fall into the hands of the ones that have been doing and practicing it. 
And if they are not keeping the thought forms pristine and are knowing what to do, which they don't, because it's not their idea foundationally, then that thought form will begin to collapse and it will go into distortion because it has lost its purpose. It is tied to the inventor. And that's some of the things we need to understand as change makers as well. What When we work with energy, if we want to use energy on a higher level to change something inside the base program, we are tied to our invention. And we were that originally anyways. That's one of the reasons why I'm here on my own personal mission to take down what was left of the pillar project, what I was part of engineering back then. So that's some of the work that I've been doing here to take down that technology. That's why I know so much about the alien technology because they took the original Pillar Project technologies and they reverse engineer it for their purpose. So I have to work through what they have been doing with the, the original program and the original technology so I can get to what is behind. And there I can begin removing the holographic units that are tied to my consciousness structure. And again, not that I have the full capacity of that inside this human form, because this human form is not engineered for my original energy system. So there is this building, constant building of getting into the knowledge and only being able to be there for a shorter period of time. And then I'm pushed back into this body and under the, what we could call the, the confinement of the emotional field and the mental field, which even though I clear it and I keep it under control and I keep it as permeable as possible, this physical form has lived a long time. It goes far, far back to the original first people of Australia. And I'm not here talking about the indigenous people. I'm talking about something further back than that. So it has a very, very long line of coding in it which means that I'm up against that coding with memories and timelines that are connected to this physical form and its ancestral DNA. But it's not part of who and what I originally were, which means that it's working against my original configuration in my energy system. So that's also a battle that we, and that's also one of the enslavement traits that we have. <coughs> Sorry about that. And that is what it means to be enslaved on this planet, that the physical form that we are in is enslaving us to the reality program. No matter how free we think we are, we are not because the enslavement is in our molecules. It's not in the environment. Because if you could change our physical form and our molecules and align with our transformative energy system, begin to work with the original network, reality would change around us because we are the beacons of light that will change the reality around us. So that's also part of the change maker understanding and strategy to know that's the goal. But with that comes also the issue of some of the things we had under the, the Atlantean project. And that's the issue of the correct use of power, which is principle eight or principle nine, correct use of energy and correct use of power, eight and nine. So this is, this is where when you get to that level, the highest level on a planetary setting, because our reality field, the planet as it is now, can only go up to nine dimensions. And that's all the nine principles, which are a representation of the different dimensions of our reality field. So when you work with these two highest level here, eight and nine, and that's where most fall, fell and fall because um, the correct use of energy is what went wrong in Atlantis, right? They used it for personal gain because principle nine were used for personal power, personal service to self. And that has enormous ramifications, which is built into this, this body that we created after the timeline event because of the ill-mindedness. So the this, this system begins to shut down. But as it begins to shut down, it also opens up for third cycle entities and second cycle entities. So that's a problem. So you can kind of say, well, why was it made that way? Well, it's not made that way per se. It's due to the laws of energetic and genetic affinity. How you use your energy system, how you use the principles and how you bend the laws or work according to the laws will define the type of energy that your transformative energy system will process of information systems and energies and will drive you to the areas of the planet where you are in alignment with. So if you are kind of when I was working through some of my older layers of my energy system, it was natural for me to go to Australia. Not that I thought, oh yeah, I wanted to go there. Circumstances led me there. And no doubt I had a romanticized idea why I wanted to go to Australia, which 
um, when reality hit me and the struggle I had in Australia, how difficult it was to me to try and just get rooted in Australia as working with the factions, trying to think, well, you can collaborate with the different factions. And some of them wanted to collaborate and others didn't want to collaborate because they saw me as a threat coming from the European factions, which the the Australian factions, they went there to get rid of the European factions back in the 1700, where we begin to have these colonization of other pieces of our planet, which again is completely wrong and shouldn't be. And if you ask me on a higher energetic level, it's completely impossible. It can't be done. But technically, every civilization that came from Europe and colonized countries that were not theirs and are suppressing the original people, the indigenous people, should either balance that out and make sure that the indigenous people get all of the same possibilities and probabilities of growth and and, uh, future prospects of wealth as the colonizers have. That would be one way to balance it out. And we're seeing that even in Australia and in America, how difficult it still is for people to accept the fact that they are not in their own country, they have invaded it and they are still treating whoever's around them as subhumans, which again baffles me. But I'm not saying that we are betting Denmark because we have Greenland, right? And we have the same issues with our the, the indigenous people of Greenland as well, because they're, they are early versions of fourth cycle. So they work in a different way where those of us who are, quote unquote, from the Caucasian lineages, we are the early versions of the fifth cycle. Not that it makes us better or anything, but we make we work in a more logical, rational, scientific way. And quite a lot of our population have the issues with the wrongful use of energy and wrongful use of power, right? We have the power issue and the service to self issue we are struggling with, which is the key signature of the fifth cycle. And that is what led to the fall of Atlantis. But you can say the indigenous people, they have what we call the key features of the tribal consciousness and the superstition and the lack of control of their emotional field and are tied up to so much distortion energies because of their age. They are ancient people. So they were seated in in a reality that has access to the subconscious level of our planet, the distortion fields or the astral plane. And they are highly connected to that. And many of them are controlled by some of the colonizing ant people, uh, and which are the ones that are, if you ask me, uh, we talk about the shamans or the medicine man and woman. They, they are working on the behalf of the ant or a snake or something else, which we see, we talk about the white Syrian snakes that are behind Buddhism, uh, as well as in Hindu. That's where I came with the underworld. It's Compose the different types of snakes, but this is this is part of the reality. You, see, you hear that with the indigenous people in Australia as well. They worship the snake, so we are having similar as the Mayans and many of these ancient cultures. They were worshiping specific deities that had forms of the colonizers, aka avian, insectoid, uh, reptoid, or some type of mammal creature. So these are, of course, completely under the control of the colonizers and the old world order. So that's their problem. And as long as they are seeing these alien factions as gods, there's nothing we can do about it. So that's the clash we have between their culture and our culture. And because of the astral plane and the way they've been treated and how they are emotionally constantly drawn into the negative side of reality due to the different uh, parasites that they are connected to, which we are as well. But we have that one feature with the fifth cycle. We have begun to use our frontal lobes to control this. Not that it has led us in any better direction, but just to pu- push out, put out there, we ha- that's why some of the clashes come up because we have a different worldview, which again, when we talk about people that want to go to Africa and they want to create a well and they want to solve the water issue or whatever's going on there. They think that they are going to a country with people like them and that are thinking like they are and that of course should think that that idea is a good idea. And then they come to Africa and then in spite of the rationale and the logic of, yeah, let's build that well, and I got this shitload of money, when we come in as white people uh, colonizing, because we have a reputation out there. So when white people come in and try to do something for people of color, 
we are not received by our good intentions. They are seeing a white human that again, 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 again is coming in and trying to tell them what to do and how to do because we are clearly the super lords and they are clearly the, the underdogs. And then they go into an emotional resistance that has nothing to do with the, with the process and the project itself, which often literally lets the project to fall to the ground. We have heard it so many times. You come in, you want to build something, you want to do, you want to use, you use local workers because then they can learn while they're building, while they're doing this. And then once you're done and you pull out, they can continue the project. But they don't take orders. They don't want to take orders. They want to do it their way. And the preferred would be that if we had the inventors within that group of people that themselves would rise up to solve these issues. But they have some kind of prohibiting technology, especially when we talk about uh, Africa, not all of Africa, because we know there are different jurisdictions there. Ghana is one of the different jurisdictions or South Africa, which we know is colonized and so on, so onward and so forth. But when we talk about the areas that are kept in what we call a very primitive settings, as we're seeing it in the Middle East and some of these countries that are reverting to the states of the Middle Ages, they are controlled by the Dark Avatar Collective and the different groups within there. And they have no interest whatsoever in people getting out of the pain and suffering program. They want to keep people under the cross. They want to keep them suppressed and imprisoned under the old spells and under the old pain and suffering programs. So, so that's also some of the things that we need to take into consideration. If you want to be change makers, what are you, where, where do you want to put your battle, right? How, which battle do you want to pick? And I remember being, I uh, talked about this before uh, when I was, uh, in 2004, I was working at an institute where I was working as a secretary. Yeah, I've <laughs> been doing that. Anyways, I quickly showed my uh, effect effectiveness and uh, I was quickly put into being something else. But the whole battle I had there with my boss, because I always get very quickly up to the level where I'm dealing with the boss directly because I'm a clever girl. As you know, I'm coming up with a lot of good ideas. And some of this resistance to change, because I did, as I said, I had this degree in cultural change and organizational theory, and I forgot the fancy buzzwords that all of this is called, or organizational management and all of these kind of things, resource management, uh, um, how to... Oh, I forgot all the fancy words. They will come back. That's because I'm not supposed to go down into that line of thought right now. But the, the idea was that... Um, I have, I was taking on battles as I tried to change the culture, the hidden culture of that department I was working in, uh, assisted by my boss and some of the, dis the discussions that we had. And I came into a little bit of, a, there were some bosses that the, of the old school that were there that were not very keen on, uh, you know, you have a board set up, you have I, the boss I was working with, he was of younger generation, then you had the board of the older generation, and he was struggling with them as well. And I came into a little bit of a clinch with some of the, one of the, the guys there uh, with some of the work I was doing. Anyways, point being, I and a colleague of me told me, you should pick your fights. And that is probably one of the best advices I've ever gotten because with that one, there's a huge respect for what I was doing as in kind of this is what you're doing is good, Randy, but pick your fights. Don't take them all. You don't have to take all the fights. Go where you actually have a possibility of winning. And that's... um I know many of you are saying, no, 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 we can't do that because we're good people and we want to think the best of everybody that's around us. And we want to think that if only we, it, it kind of goes with that romanticized idea, which is some of the things females suffer under. Males have a different form of distortion. I am pretty sure about that. Uh, they can, yeah, females have this. As long as we just give it love and kindness, then we can change whatever is around us. Duh. That is not going to happen. If you're in front of a predator, you can love it as much as you like. It will still eat you. So that's not a strategy we can rely on. It does 
push us a long way with good intentions and being harmless and be diplomatic and understanding the people that we are around and and talk to their comfort zone and soothe their egos and all these kind of things that we need to do. But that's technically what we call a psychological feature. It has nothing to do with love. It has to do with the understanding of how to be around people and create a productive work environment. And when we talk about guys, it's about, yeah, I just need the money. I just need the invention. Then I can fix it. I can fix it, fix it, fix it. And you know, I'm more the fix it type than the, the love to death type, right? Even though I have the features of it, because as you know, I am in a female body. So it has its own programming. I'm struggling with from time to time when it pops up. And for sure, love is never enough. It is never enough because love is an illusion. It's an electrochemical projection mechanism that we base upon how we perceive reality to be and how we want other people to be. And we put them into that projection light of our dream creation of what we think they are and not what they actually are. And that is what love is. We are putting people into a specific type of light, which of course goes with the original amplification. So it would be 10 times better to look at it as a kind of productive management as a not in leadership management is kind of when you manage something, it's administration, but when we talk leadership, again, the, the differences between the words, when we talk about productive leadership, when we come in and we know how to work with people and we can say that's not easy either because we kind of seen that and I've experienced that, that as well when people come with what they have and who they are and what they are made of and they put that into the game as well as when we begin to create a group of people we will add in everything that we are into the group energy and then the leader will be the one that has to administer that. And something interesting happens with people when we go into this group um, team uh, situation. They begin to organize themselves and hierarchical. They go into the group dynamics. They go into the tribal consciousness structure where they try to work as a tribe and then we'll have the leaders and we'll have the ones that are the losers and we'll have the ones in between and we'll have that group and that group and people fall into these different roles which of course is made by our programming so again when we talk about being change makers and change the world it's the logical thing would say how fucking excuse my language difficult is it just to kind of say well we have a got a water issue worldwide let us collaborate to figure that one out. It's a matter of money. We have got enough of that. There are investors that should get a little bit philanthropic and go from this whole service to self. They have got so many fucking billions that if we could do a little bit of talk with them as in, yeah, you can do this and you would get that, that whatever, something that they feel is important for them. We should go for these um billionaires that kind of achieved everything. They have bought everything they can buy on this planet and now they're trying to get to the moon because they need to do something that gives them their adrenaline kick. So let's find something to give them that kick of actually kind of saying, okay, let's, let's create this enormously great master program where you go in as investors and we, we ensure that we have got free, clear water for all on the planet. How is that even possible for me as an inventor and for me as a pioneer? That, that accelerates me. It's a kind of a complete kick off. How would that be done? My brain is going ding. How would that be done? And if you have all the money in the world, then you need to do that. Then it's just a matter of again, assembling the team that kind of go in and, okay, how do we solve this? And then you have the whole project management, the, the ones that the leadership of it, how is that going to be? And then if we could work with some new ideas of how we were actually doing that as teams and at the same time doing the progression work, you see my mind is spinning off. The idea is great. The problem is never the ideas. It's not the money either. A technique is just a matter of, of getting in contact with the right people. And there are a sufficient of material resources out there if we decided to go together nationwide to solve that issue. No, it's ne that's never the problem. And that's what change makers and inventors are always butting their heads up against. Against they, they, it's not about the materialistic things because that's the easy part. That is so easy peasy, right? But the problem is people always 
the resistance to change. Always this and this is where we as change makers again and again and again must come up to terms with the people that we have around us. Stop projecting your infantile, good hearted understanding of other people to people. See them as they are. Figure out what are we dealing with? Are we actually standing in front of a human or are we in a, some kind of alien in human suit? And I know people are just saying, Oh yeah, I've seen too many movies of that one. That's the body snatchers. That's eh, 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 not going there. But this is again the problem. You think because you've been conditioned to think so because you have been blocked from seeing reality as it truly is. You think that people around you are people like you and we are a kind of a species or a race. We never were. We are in an engineered suit engineered for this program, but our souls, if you want to put it that way, are different. We come from different systems. We are a different species on the inside. That means you have a human that looks human, talks human, walks human, but is a reptile. You have a human that walks human, talks human, and behave human, but is a snake. These kind of things. And you don't see it until it's too late when it shows its ugly head and it attacks you. And that's why you get, ah, oh, yeah, but then you have to make the distinction. Is it because that human is actually a true human, but has been enslaved and by that has a plethora of creatures connected to him or her and by that are in no control of who and what they are, even though they are on a top position in some fancy pitsy pansy business or they are some of the great change makers of our world or they're doing great projects out there. Some of them are not human. Mother Teresa was not human. She was one of these Orion insectoid. <laughs> when they get older, you can see what they are. Then it's quickly to see through. So it's all about when we talk about Mother Teresa and all the good she did, why did she do all of that good? But the question is, did she do actually do good or was it just appearance of good? Just asking the question, did she really make a change or did she just take care of all of the sick and the impaired and then showed good Christian heart because nobody else was doing it in India at the time or wherever it was around the planet? She was promoting God, etc., etc. So was she really that good? It's a bitty pansy offensive thing, as well as uh, Princess Diana just going there as well. Just kind of, oh, Randy, you're taking away all of my illusions of all of these good people and all. I remember uh, in the 90s, because I was doing spiritual work there as well, all the people, oh, yeah, she's got, she's got this radiation of kindness and green energy, and she's a heart person, and she's got an evolved heart chakra, and all of these programs that people were brainwashed to perceive from and via. So people that kind of went into this whole link up to Diana, giving her shitloads of energy from a specific program that allowed her to kind of unfold certain features within the British uh, royalty and the, their, um, within the royal house, so to speak. So, so there was a, there was a, um, a purpose on that one that we're trying to make changes. And the changes technically were in her sons because these kids are hybrids. I'm just really revealing a lot of stuff here. So. <clears throat> She was a breeder. She was nothing but a breeder. She was never anything else, but she needed all that energy from people to keep her in a specific type of configuration so she would not succumb to what the, the complete distortedness of the, the English, the British royal house and whoever and the nobilities and the lineages and whatever's going on there, which uh, again has different features, all depending on who you're asking, right? David Icke, he has definitely his perception of it, which I don't agree with. I see them as something else. But again, we are seeing what we want to see or what we think we see or what is possible to be seen. And uh, again, some of these high level creatures are shapeshifters and they can create illusions so that they pretend to be something when they, the matter of the fact is something entirely else. But they're using that overlay so that people will point their, their energy towards a specific group, which they have nothing to do with. Or they can from time to other take on that form because they have been part of that group. We're talking about reptilians. And then they can revert back into something else. So, so again, the level of understanding of what we are actually dealing with on this planet is way beyond what most people know. And not until you get into the mess do you understand what you're actually dealing with. 
So that's also a little bit uh, of the change maker ideology and understanding and some of the things that we're dealing with uh, in this line of uh, um, videos that I'm going to make. And I had, as I said, I had an original idea somewhere, but as I'm unraveling it, I'm seeing, oh, this is going to be a course material. So so I'm here by shifting it a little bit from being what I normally do in these um over many months where I'm sharing, quote unquote, the news going into B. Yes, there will be news definitely, but this is, this is course material. So I'm here doing a double up saying this is both the news, but it's also going into the issues of what it means to be a change maker. So it will also be course material. And I think that's a good way to put it. So we both have the news, but at the same time are also learning what it means to be a change maker in this world, because the news will technically not make sense unless you have a foundational understanding of why these news are important, such as when we talk about the Arcturians that are crystallizing our sun and what that means, because that's going to hit our environment. So as a change maker, what are the implications of that? What will that mean to us? when they implement different type of alien technology. So that's also all depending on how we work and where we are working and with what we are working. So again, when we talk about change makers, for me, it's about the knowledge. It's about the processes of learning to understand this knowledge. And it is the process of learning to implement this knowledge as energetic change. Because again, when we talk change makers out in the physical world, it's the simplest of things. You just need the money and then you can buy whatever. And then you need a group of people that are working with you that you can lead in the right way. So, and if they have all sorts of resistance, that's the problem. The problem is not the people. The problem is not the money. The problem is not the will, because technically, if we ask any person on this planet on a good day, of course, we want a better world where everybody has free access to water and food and housing and what have you. So the problem lies a different place. The problem lies in these people when they're on the good days, they're in themselves, their own personality matrix, and there they can agree. But then they begin working with you on that project. And then they if they get too far into changing their energy system as in kind of being altruistic and good and working as a team and begin to complete the key uh, signature of the fourth cycle, the energetic parasites kick in. And if that's not enough, the factions that owns the template will pop through and make sure that we get put back in line and get out of our elevation of work and start working together as a team. You remember the Tower of Babel, right? We are not supposed to communicate to build the tower so we will become like the gods. It is a complete understanding. Again, all mythology that's connected to the fourth cycle, the early versions of our humans, all tells us the same story. You're only allowed to do what the gods allow you to do. So that's also part of the changing as in kind of how do we get to the point where we are actually equal as the gods? Because you see, the moment we begin to regain our true solar system potentials as an advanced civilization energetically and consciously, we cannot be enslaved. We are not allowed to be enslaved. We are allowed to be enslaved because humans on this planet in all fucking ways and forms, including all of the races that are here that are ensuring that we continuously act as if we have no real power, as if we have no real understanding of reality, as if we are always making the wrong decisions. So whenever people are really trying to work together, the energetic parasites make sure that we go into becoming alienated and separatistic and work against each other. Seeing how it's going out there in the world, we're supposed to do the elevation cycle. The whole reality field works to get us to do the elevation cycle. The progressive world pushes us to do the elevation cycles. Everybody is trying to get energy our way so we can get the awakening process started. But who is here and what remains here and what have us under control in the old world order factions and the enslaving races, et cetera, et cetera. They are countering this. They are working against this. They are fighting to their teeth to keep us in that oblivion state, to keep us downsized, to keep us fighting each other, to keep us making the wrong decisions so that they will 
regain and remain their control over us. I know that's not used correctly, but they, so they can remain that control they have over us so that they have this system as they are. So once the elevation cycle reaches a certain momentum, they can, by the laws of the races, say, this civilization is not ready to move on. So we will ensure that they will take another cycle within this level of reality, again, due to the laws of energy and consciousness affinity. They will make sure that once the original dynamics kick in, humanity will naturally align with these negative groups because humans are acting, working, thinking, feeling, being, existing within that configuration that they are putting out for humanity. And humanity are not fighting it. They're not transforming it. They're not changing it. They're just going with the flow because the sacrifices they have to make to get out of these entanglements, out of these programs are too high for many people. And they don't have the balls, to put it that way, to make these decisions because what is at the other end? They don't know. They don't know it will lead to anything. And the chances they get to get out of the entanglement always comes before you are psychologically ready for it. It never comes when you're ready. Then you have passed the window. You're given the opportunity when you don't dare take it. That's how these groups are playing us. So that's why you need to grow a pair. And that's why you need to get into that understanding of whatever comes my way, I can deal with it. I will learn. I will survive. I'm not going to succumb and perish while I'm doing it. And even if I am succumbing and perishing while I'm doing it, well, at least I tried. So it's a different mentality that a change maker has. You have to have that little bit of warrior in your stomach that kind of takes the challenges and you see it as something that's exciting and not something that's fear provoking. But I know it's easier for me to say so because I trained this for so long. It's part of my original energy system. And some of you are, per definition, farmers, you are from some of the more peaceful systems around our planet and came here and you don't have that warrior in your stomach. So for you that are in the fourth cycle and have the tribal awareness, this is, this is a maturity um, process and a, a, a leap of faith into becoming something that is going against everything that you technically are. So that's the first step that you need to transform and those of us who are getting ready for the fifth cycle as that already kind of are the pioneers, we have our challenges as well. Nobody is free of challenges here. They are just on different levels and not levels as in good or bad, or this is higher or lower or building a hierarchy, but they are related to different features that goes with our energy system and what we have of all types of infection, all types of distortion, all different types of technologies and different types of issues and different types of weaknesses in our personality structure, which is, again, some of the things that we have to deal with as change makers, no matter which cycle we are part of, whether we are to transform and learn the transformative changing processes of the fourth cycle, or we are to learn the pioneering scientific endeavor, putting things into implementation in the fifth cycle doesn't matter. We struggle wherever we are. We just need to understand and be honest about where we are so we can work with it correctly. See things as they truly are. Not until you see what you are and what's in front of you and what you're dealing with can you find the solution. As long as you're blind to what's actually going on, you're also blind to the solution. Thank you.